Hello, welcome to this edition of Health First. Today we will hear from Dr. Robert Ward as he talks with us about lower chronic back pain. Stay tuned. Um, we put this talk together today um, through one of my, uh, through myself and through one of my um, spine product representatives um, that uh, has been a big, uh, big help to me in a sort of a new hot area in spine because uh, most people that have this don't know they have it and doctors don't check for it. The, uh, as, as the slide says, the forgotten back pain generator, I'm not sure that it's forgotten as much as it's just not looked for. I mean, we've always known SI joint, and then, by the way, SI joint, same as sacroiliac joint. I'm going to say SIJ or SI joint. Um, uh, so this is sort of what we're going to talk about today a little bit, a few minutes on each one of these things, not necessarily in this order. Um, and. Um, the, uh, the prevalence of SI joint pain is uh, very high. The prevalence of back pain is extremely high. 85% of us at some time in our life will have a serious episode of back pain. Whether that lasts a day or two or three just depends on what exactly causes your pain. Um, back pain is uh, second. You look at diagnoses, I mean the most common tr reason for trips to the emergency room or to a doctor's office is for a cold, okay? Back pain is number two. Um, you look at that, 15 million office visits annually. Um, you know, the fifth ranked, you know, highest, uh, fifth highest rank for admission to the hospital is back pain, okay? And that includes a lot of things. It includes fractures of the back and ruptured discs and um, surgeries, uh, but it's extremely high. And you see the cost there, if you can read the screen, $86 billion annually. And that's going up, by the way, all the time, especially as the population is living longer and longer. Um, patients are living long enough to have some of the, some of the, the problems we're encountering today. Uh, the most common surgery I do is for spinal stenosis, okay, narrowing of the spinal canal. Um, and people are just living longer and healthier to where they're in their 70s and 80s and 90s and they can't walk far because their legs hurt. And um, that's spinal stenosis generally. Uh, SI joint, we're starting, since we started looking for it more and realizing how much it can hurt, uh, we started finding um, a tremendous amount uh, of SI joint pain that uh, was always there. We just, uh, physicians don't look for it. There are specific tests to look for it. A uh, couple of terms here, we'll talk about SI joint dysfunction, um, uh, SI joint pain, sacroiliitis. There's several diagnosis codes. We have to use codes for everything, well, whether it's Medicare, or Blue Cross, or whoever. And SI joint dysfunction generally requires to abnormal motion of the SI joint, okay? Hypomobility is less mobile, hypermobility is more mobile than normal. Um, and basically it's the same as, an, a, you know, if you think of most of you are familiar with arthritic knees or hips, and the main thing wrong with an arthritic joint is change in biomechanics of the joint. Um, good Lord built us to function in a specific way, for the knee to move in a very specific direction and to have a certain amount of cartilage to make it a nice, smooth range of motion. Well, you get arthritis in there, and it really changes the biomechanics of the knee, or you have a previous injury. You get a torn cartilage, torn meniscus, uh, whatever. Anytime you alter the normal anatomy of a knee joint, then it sets it up for you know rapid degeneration. Okay. Um, the same can happen in the sacroiliac joint. Um, a previous injury, uh, traumatic, you know, really. Uh, difficult uh, labor and delivery, um, a car accident, a hard fall can set up some altered biomechanics in the joint and then you end up with arthritis in the joint and you end up with SI joint pain um, uh, and possibly what we call sacroiliac uh, uh, syndrome. Um, and so, and that's more of a, syndrome is more of a chronic kind of pain. There's some people who have SI joint pain that will come and go and there's others that um, uh, it's there all the time. Just several studies, you'll see a couple of slides I'll show um, from some uh, known um, uh, guys in the, uh, or physicians in the literature that do research and report results of different things. Um, and uh, 20, you know, first, first thing, 22.5% of in one study of patients that had low back pain um, also had uh, SI joint pain, okay? Um, Less than 25% in another study of people with um, low back pain was it an SI joint, of SI joint origin, although other authors have found higher. The average is between 13 and 
of patients um, that have actually SI joint pain and low back pain together. And you're not going to find the SI joint if you don't look for it. That's something we call a differential diagnosis. We had, I, I learned this in medical school. Um, if you're not thinking about it, you'll never make the diagnosis. Okay? And it really is true. If I see somebody and they're complaining of chest pain, I can think of a lot of things. I can think of heart, uh, heart attack, congestive heart failure. I don't do this, by the way. I don't work in the chest anymore. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the, you know, I can think about a lot of things, but if I'm, you know, I can think about pneumonia, I can think about pleurisy, I can think of all kind of things, but if I'm not thinking about a fractured rib, I'll never make the diagnosis, okay? Uh, you've got to have all these things in the back of your mind of what it might be. And so that's sort of why SI joint pain is missed so much. Um, there's a, um, one study suggests that 18.5% of incidents of uh, SI joint pain in patients that have low back pain, chronic low back pain, they also have it, okay? Um, and another study reports 27%. And so there's several studies to, that show, and there's specific ways to determine about SI joint pain, whether you really have it or not. Um, the first way is a physical exam. Um, and if you don't get the exam for it, if you don't do the exam, you'll never make the diagnosis. Um, there's provocative tests for the joint. I'll talk about that in a minute. Spine surgeon's approach to the SI joint, most of them has, in the past has been uh, rarely included in the differential diagnosis, as I mentioned. If you don't include it, you will not make the diagnosis. Um, the treatment, formerly the treatment was too invasive. I, I did some SI joint fusions as a resident um, when I was in my training um, in uh, San Antonio. And uh, they're big procedures. You have to make an, uh, a large incision and move, um, you know, the, the pelvic organs to the side and put in bone graft and plates and screws. And it's a really big uh, deal. Um, and so surgeons generally, spine surgeons, and orthopedic surgeons would be, well, I don't want to do that surgery, so if I can't really treat that, then I'm not going to look for it, okay? And, um, you know, a lot of us do that with our, <laughs> with our health. I don't, I don't think I have high blood pressure, and I don't want to have high blood pressure, and so I'm not going to go to the doctor to find out if I have it. So if I don't have it, I don't need to treat it, right? Sort of, sort of, sort of doctors sometimes will do the same thing. I don't want to treat it, so I'm not going to look for it. Um, <clears throat> sacroiliac joint problems can arise from, and I've got a pointer here I keep forgetting about, uh, degenerative uh, disease can arise from trauma, pregnancy, childbirth. And one I didn't mention earlier was lumbar, previous lumbar fusion. Very high rate of patients that have had a back fusion um, have SI joint pain, okay? There are several of my patients in the room that I know have had back fusions. and. I generally don't test for SI joint pain on everybody I see, but I will if I'm not, if someone's just not getting better. Um, but you can disrupt the ligaments about the spine. There's a, uh, this is sort of a, there's another model, we'll see a few in a minute, but this is your pelvis. You have a, a hemipelvis on each side. You have a left hemipelvis and a right hemipelvis. Uh, we're actually looking from behind right here on this particular view, so that's why I'm saying left here. Uh, hips, hip joints. Um, these uh, the little anatomy here, these strong ligaments you have between your sacrum and your ilium. That's why it's called sacroiliac joint. That joint is right in there. Um, and then here, of course, the lumbar vertebra um, uh, just above. The few things here, disruption um, uh, of the SI joint can happen, as I mentioned, with injury, with trauma, with a car accident. Um, the good Lord built the pelvis to expand and contract uh, for childbirth. Uh, the body actually releases a substance called elastin that loosens ligaments for childbirth and allows the you know, SI joint to open up. Some people, they open up too much um, and um, have pain uh, from that point on or uh, may not have pain until they develop degenerative changes later on. Um, so what I talked about is adjacent segment disorder. People that have previous back surgery, previous lumbar fusion that have SI joint pain. What happens is you take out, and I've talked to my patients about this all the time, especially if I do a fusion on their back. You take out one shock absorber in the system, what happens? It transfers the stress to the next shock absorbers, all right? Um, and so the, we're built in a way that uh, the discs between our vertebra, between the building blocks in our back, all distribute the 
the stress equally as we walk, as we sit, as we jog, um, if you still do that. Um, the only thing I jog to is the kitchen table. No, I'm teasing. I still exercise. Um, more so in my yard than anywhere. If I'm not working, I am. I'm, I'm on a tiller or a tractor running a chainsaw or doing something, but I love to do that. Um, I can't remember where I was. Um, see, it happens, at, it happens at a young age, too. Um, so, this adjacent segment disorder, you take out one shock absorber in the system and it affects the others. Well, the SI joint is very common to have problems if you've had a previous back fusion because you've taken a segment that was absorbing stress, you've, solid, you've fused it solid, and now those stressors are being distributed to the discs above and to the um, junction between the sacrum and the pelvis. Um, and also, well, something that's not mentioned in this slide, uh, in this slide presentation, is that we take bone graft, and especially I do, I take bone graft from the iliac crests. I take them from very near where the SI joint is. I take, wrong button, Robbie, right here. I take bone graft from this area right here, right adjacent to the SI joint. And there are many authors that believe that um, disrupting that area to take bone graft can contribute to the SI joint pain down the road. Okay, so it's a hot topic in spine surgery now, the hip-spine relationship, um, and, and adjacent, ASD stands for adjacent segment disorder. The SI joint it has been shown as a legitimate proven site of uh, adjacent segment disorder. That means you work on one area, you get a problem right next to it. It happens in the neck, not all the time, but 15 to 20 percent of the time, you fuse one segment, you're going to have a problem with the next one within five or ten years, if not sooner. Um, so here's a couple of studies um, from Dr. Ha. SI joint degeneration develops more often in patients undergoing lumbosacral fusion, regardless of the number of fusion segments. Okay, even you, you just have one fused, um, the, you can have um, uh, SI joint dysfunction. I see. I look around the room. And I see a few of my patients that have more than one fused, and they know who they are. I can't point them out because of HIPAA laws, right? Uh, but but there, there's several in the room that have more than one fuse. Um, uh, the fusion at the lumbar spine level increased motion and stresses at the SI joint. That was actually studied um, in human being, real life humans and in a laboratory um, about the motion of the SI joint and how it was affected with a, a fusion procedure. So it's something to think about. I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, I really do treat people like I want to be treated. I'm hoping that none of you have to have anything done to your SI joint except maybe some injections or some physical therapy. Um, I, yes, I'm a surgeon. That's what I do for a living. But I make, make people better, too, without operating on them. Um, um, but this is a number of you. If you've had problems with your SI joint, you've had injections in the past, um, there's a number of you that may benefit from some of the newer treatments that are out there. Um, this one um, study that um, shows degeneration of the SI joint after instrumental lumbar fusion. This is actually one of the studies I was, was talking about by Dr. Ha. Um, the instance of SI joint degeneration in the fusion group was 75%, 24 32 fusions, um, which is significantly higher than uh, a normal control group that had not um, undergone an SI joint, uh, I mean, a, a lumbar fusion. So it is definitely increased by increased mechanical forces um, because another level something nearby was worked on and you just have you have to think of that that in layman's terms I know you guys if I use big medical words you can raise up your hand and say duh I don't know what that means you just think of it in in real simple terms I mean you think of it in dominoes if one domino falls what happens to the next one it's gonna fall it's gonna hit it and it's gonna fall you know shock absorbers is the best way to think about it he put four shocks under, um, under a vehicle and you take out one shock, okay, you just make it rigid. How's that car going to ride? It's going to ride bumpy as can be on that front wherever you put that one rigid shock, okay, you just put a steel bar, not another shock. It's going to ride really, really bumpy. All the other shocks are going to feel that too, as well as some other brackets and joints and screws and, and before you know it, things start loosening up. So that's what's happening when you, when you fuse one segment, which we have to do. I have to do fusions all the time because people are unstable uh, and, uh, and they're, they're soon to not be walking if we don't, don't fix them. But we know it can cause problems down the road. <clears throat> 
So here's a little better picture here um, of the stress model with um, weight coming down from the upper body, and some of us have more of that weight coming down than others. Um, here's the sacrum, okay? So we call it sacroiliac. Here's the ilium, right? Sacroiliac, there's the joint right there. And so the normal stresses come down and spread over through the pelvis and into the hips and down the legs. It's the largest axial joint in the body. When I say axial, uh, there's an appendicular skeleton, appendages, right? Arms and legs. And there's an axial skeleton. The axial skeleton is the skull, the vertebra, and the pelvis. The appendicular skeleton is arms and legs. So just think of up and down. Skull, neck, thoracic spine, lumbar spine, sacrum, pelvis. So it's the largest axial joint in the body. It's a very large surface area of 17.5 centimeters. Um, the, you'd probably be better if you just look at my hands, but the SI joint has a surface area. Of, if you put your fingers together about like so, that might be a tad bit large, but it's a lo very large um, surface area. Um, don't worry about the big words of weight bearing, triplanar. Triplanar just means different planes. You know, like if you cut somebody straight up and down, sideways, and in half, that's three different planes that that joint functions in. It functions in what we call the coronial, axial, and um, sagittal planes. Um, and it transmits weight, obviously, to the lower body, but also up. It also transmits stresses up if you take a big impact on your legs. Um, so we've shown some of this before. You have these big ligaments. I know you guys can't read these walls. This is looking at the front of the pelvis. You have anterior sacroiliac ligaments, and you have posterior ones in the back. Um, you have some lumbosacral ligaments that are very, very strong. Um, you have inter, what we call interosseous ligaments that you can't see here, but are between the SI joint and the pelvis. Um, very, very strong ligaments. I, I learned, um, I used to have to, in people that had donated their bodies um, to science, basically, or we harvested bones from people that, you know, after they took the organs, uh, I was part of the team that come in and take bones. I know from first-hand experience of how strong those ligaments are because I used to have to cut through them a lot. Um, some of the strongest ligaments in the body are right here, but they can still be disrupted in a, you know, in trauma with a fall, with a car accident. Um, and there's a reason, I mean, that joint does move. It doesn't move much. It's a gliding kind of joint. It moves just a little bit, um, but there's a reason God built it with such strong ligaments. He didn't want it to move too much um, um, because it would set up to generation down the road. And that can happen in many people with, with an injury to these ligaments. Uh, here's just a back view, just showing more um, ligaments. Uh, and they all have big, big, long names that you don't need to remember. They can be disrupted and uh, can be, obviously can become arthritic. This is a picture showing all the nerves that go around the SI joint. I actually have patients that have some, that I think have pain all the way to their feet because of um, really bad arthritic SI joint that are irritating the nerves that pass right over the front of that joint, okay? These are the nerves that come out of the back. Um, and if there, this is a good point. I've got a few more minutes so I can talk here. Where the, lung, where the nerves come out of the low back, people don't understand. People say, I've got sciatica. I've got a sciatic nerve in my leg. It's the problem. Um, that is rarely ever the problem. The, the problem is rarely ever between your sacrum and your foot. The problem is almost always in your back or around in this area here. SI joint, or, I mean not SI joint, um, uh, sciatica is one, usually one of many nerves that contribute to the sciatic nerve that's being affected. You can have one pinched nerve in your back, um, and I'm talking of six, seven nerves that contribute to the sciatic nerve. You can have one pinched nerve in your back and have, still have sciatica, okay? The problem is usually in your back. Um, I've seen a few cases and a very limited number of cases where that nerve, the sciatic nerve, was actually being pinched somewhere other than the back, okay? So it's just, a, I just sort of stuck that in here. Um, if you're having pain shooting down your legs or your feet, it's, it's, it's either a neuropathy, uh, a muscle problem, a pinched nerve in your back, or something like that. Uh, but it can rarely be the SI joint as well. Um, the uh, symptoms of the pain, it can be anything. I've actually seen, as I said, I've seen some patients with pain beyond their knee that I think were coming from the SI joint. Uh, but patients will generally complain of back pain. They'll generally point right to where it hurts. And there's a picture on the next couple slides. Patients will point right to uh, the area of the pain. 
but it can be buttock, it can be radiating around to the thigh, it can be sciatic like down the leg. Um, they can have difficulty sitting, particularly on that side. It's often hard to sit on that side. They'll want to sit on the other buttock, okay? And then you're really in trouble if you have bilateral. That means both sides, sciatic pain. And you cannot sit on one, you're constantly shifting one side to the other. Um, algorithm is basically, if you're not familiar with that word, it's a word we use all the time in medicine. Um, but algorithm is basically a diagram of what to do next, okay? Pain, no pain. Um, responds to this, what do you do? It gets better with this, what do you do? It's just a big flow chart of what you do next. Um, and so patients present with all of this stuff here, not all of them, but they can have one or many. Uh, low back pain, pelvis, buttock, hip, groin, lower extremity, that means legs. Um, numbness, tingling, weakness, and usually not this, it's usually limited to pain right in this area, but I get pain with patients with pain in the buttocks and back of the legs all the time. Most of the patients I see with that though have something else called spinal stenosis. Uh, poor sleep, ha sleep habits, unilateral is a, is, means one leg, okay? Um, and uh, so you can have pain in just one hip or one leg. Um, diagnosing is um, not diagnosed real often. It is more now since um, we have a new procedure to treat it that, guy, that the surgery to fix it um, is fairly easy. The injections to make it better is fairly easy. Um, so uh, most of us spine guys are starting to look for it more um, uh, because we can be of more service to patients um, and, uh, and help out. Um, so sort of being rediscovered, um, I guess, um, in a way we're looking for it more. Um, it's not a normal part of a low back pain workup. Most spine guys don't do the SI joint stress uh, procedures. Um, so it's often not diagnosed. Um, physicians aren't trying to look for it. And so obviously if you're going to treat something, you need to know what you're treating. Uh, you need to make the proper diagnosis. So, and the, and the thing too is the pain can mimic other stuff. People come in and complain pain right there. Oh, it's low back pain. Do this, this, and this, you know. Physical therapy, medicine, whatever. Uh, they don't get better and then they go back and the doctor's like, well, I don't know why you're not better. Um, it's nothing I can do for you. You know, I hear that a lot from patients and, and I know guys are busy and whatnot, but it just takes a little extra time to, um, to find stuff in folks. Here's an example of the Fortin finger test and it's actually, I'm sorry, I've shown you all two porn slides in one talk. One from the front and one from the back. Um, this person's pointing right where they hurt, okay? Usually if you ask them to point, they can show you. Now the Fortin finger test is actually, um, a very reliable way of finding out so, sort of where some people hurt. Um, and I have patients that are hurt here that also have problems up different areas, but they can usually put the name, put their finger right on it. Um, and um, these other, some other big words here, I know posterior, posterior beings again in the back. SI joint sulcus is a certain area where we test. Uh, but these are some things patients will do. They'll point to it. They're tender in certain areas. They'll not sit on that side. Um, and uh, we can do some tests in the office to see if you're asymmetric. This is a, these are tests, these are all tests that I do in the office. If I, if, if I suspect SI joint pain, I don't do this on everybody because it's, a, it's five to six different tests that all require a different patient position. If I did this on everybody who walked in my office, people would be in my office till eight and nine o'clock at night instead of seven. Right, and I know a few here that have been here till late in the wee hours. <laughs> uh, I don't want them to all raise their hands, um, but we do send for pizza every now and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, if you look here, uh, this is a uh, he's, the physician's got his hands crossed. He's pushing down the pelvis. That's a distraction test. That's what we're doing here. We're distracting. This is like looking down the pelvis from the top. We're pushing the pelvis open, okay, and stressing these ligaments back here in the back. This test is a compression test. Patient's laying on their side, the physician's pushing straight down um, and compressing the segment together. That can cause pain. This is called a Patrick's or a Faber test where the leg is crossed um, like this foot and ankle are over the other side and the doctor's pushing down on the knee. That's something you could try on your significant other or have a friend do it to you if you don't have a significant other. Um, if you want to see if they're having SI joint pain, that usually hurts in the back. Uh, there's a thigh thrust test where you, and I'd grab patients' legs just like that and push down on them. Um, and then there's this weird test called a Gainslin's test 
um, that is very accurate. Uh, there's a couple of these, the thigh thrust and the Gainslands are very uh, reliable tests. Uh, but I often will get all five, or, and there's another one that I do that's not pictured here, I often get all five or six tests positive in, in a patient. And I'm pretty certain they've got something going on with the SI joint. Um, there's a, here's a, what I was talking about, this is basically a bunch of guys that did their own studies and um, came up with, um, you know, uh, a percentage of agreement with or with, with or without SI joint uh, problems, and uh, in the author's conclusion, whether the test was reliable, unreliable, indeterminate, um, and so there's a few of these. The Gainsland's test and the thigh thrust um, was by um, both authors reliable in the vast majority of the time. Okay, and so I sort of use a combination. I don't go on one test. Imaging, basically, in a nutshell, is not accurate. Imaging is not accurate. You cannot, I've had MRIs and CT scans and people that I've operated on their SI joint and they were stone cold normal looking, okay? So diagnosis was made clinically. And that means in my office. Um, one of the things, one of the, the most accurate diagnostic tests I do is, and I don't do them, I send them over to the hospital and have my anesthesiologist do it under x-ray, is uh, SI joint injections. If I suspect it, I'll send them for an injection and they'll put a combination of local anesthetic, like xylocaine, lidocaine, and a steroid in there and it will knock the pain out. I mean, it will, 100% of the time, it will knock the pain out. If I send them for an injection and it does not knock the pain out, then I'm really questioning what else is going on. Okay. They may have SI joint pain, but also something else. So uh, everybody gets an injection or two, most of the time two. Um, and the good news is, is many people do fine. My wife went for an SI joint injection two years ago. She hasn't had SI joint pain since. Um, she's had a lot of other problems, but um, God bless her. Um, she's had her neck operated on her, her back operated on, and, and other things operated on. But she's healthy. She's still in good shape. So... Uh, it's because her husband operated on her. No, I'm teasing. Um, this is, uh, the imaging studies basically are, uh, are unreliable. The, the, the pain in the SI joint is best tested by clinically in my office or by injecting it. Um, and that's what it says on that last slide, selectively infiltrating um, the putatively symptomatic joint uh, with local anesthetic completely relieves the, pa the, uh, the pain. Um, so that's the gold standard, SI joint injections. Here's a picture of a needle going into a skeleton. Um, yeah, I wish it was that easy. I've injected many SI joints and it's not real easy to get into. That's why we do it. I let them do it over in the hospital, sedate the patient a little bit, numb it up real good, and then go under x-ray. Um, I could do them in my office, but I don't know when I would do them. It's just like epidurals. I just don't have time to do epidurals two full days a week. Um, so I send them to the guys that do them for a living. Um, and so, you know, you inject that side joint and do it under fluoro. They put a little dye. Fluoro is fluoroscopy. It's a continuous x-ray. They put a dye in there and they can see that it's in the right place. They put anesthetic in there with it and you know you got it in the right spot. And then hopefully within a few minutes, uh, it's not necessarily 20 to 30 minutes. If you put lidocaine in there, lidocaine works. If, and those of you know if I injected you in my office, lidocaine works within a minute. You know, you stand up like, hallelujah. That is knees and shoulders and other stuff I do in the office. I, I think I can inject everything but the eyeballs in my office. Um, diagnostic SI joint injections. We just talked about that. This is a picture of fluoroscopy. There's a special x-ray that I use all the time in the operating room called fluoroscopy. And, you know, you push a button and hold it down and it beep, beep, beep. We do it a lot when we're doing SI joint fusions. Um, I can see exactly where I'm putting everything uh, under live, real-time fluoro, and, it's, and I can move it around. I can move around and see all different angles. Um, so that's how we do the SI joint injections. So, uh, you know, I talked about algorithm earlier. This is an algorithm. Uh, patient response to injections. No significant response, pain somewhere else. Okay? If you don't, if you inject the SI joint, you get it in the joint, and it doesn't, it's just like a knee, arthritic knee. If I inject an arthritic knee with lidocaine and steroid and all that, and they don't feel relief before they walk out of my office, there's something else going on. Um, and so, something else is going on. So you, you know, consider what procedure you're going to do from then on. If you get significant pain relief, then you repeat the injection at least once. Um, if you get a great response, then you can consider um, other things. Now, I generally will do physical therapy and injections ordered at the same time. Okay, my algorithm differs from this one just a little bit. I didn't make these slides, by the way. 
Um, I, I don't mind using them, they're good, but um, I, there's a couple other things I could insert in there. If I had the time, I would have made my own. Um, but these are good enough. Um, so there's other things I do simultaneously. There's other things I do as far as activity, as far as exercise that people don't want to hear about. Um, but not everybody that has a positive injection goes straight to surgery, okay? Because I'm very conservative. When I'm treating, if I'm treating people like I want to be treated, you know, I want to give them every opportunity to get better without surgery, okay? Those that don't make it, then I'm there for them, um, hopefully. So conservative treatment is uh, anti-inflammatories, chiropractics. Uh, yes, I send patients to chiropractors. A couple of them are buddies of mine, and, um, and they do good work. Um, when they start trying to treat things, you know, there's some guys that try to treat everything in the world, stress and diabetes and high blood pressure and everything, and, if, you know, come to me the rest of your life and we'll take care of all this. That's the ones you need to raise your eyebrows at. But there's a lot of good chiropractors out there that are my buddies and help my patients out a lot. And they send me patients and I send them to them too. Um, physical therapy, loosen and stretch out for hypomobility, um, strengthen for hypermobility. But you have to determine which of those two is the problem. Um, there's some pelvic belts that I have not found um, many people that like whatsoever. I generally, if someone is hypermobile and they cannot have a stabilization procedure, I'll put them in a belt. Uh, and then there's injections and then some other things called radio frequency ablation, which I've never seen lasting relief from a radio frequency ablation of um, many things, except the heart. Radio frequency ablation of r r arrhythmias in the heart, and some of you may have had it, it works great, but whenever somebody does nerves about the back, and I've sent patients for it back in the day, um, and they would always come back and say, well, it went away for a couple months, now it's back, because nerves regrow. So, um, SI belts I'm really not going to talk about because I haven't prescribed one in about five years. Nobody likes them. Nobody. Um, conservative treatments, physical therapy, improve flexibility, lower back stretches, and regular cardio exercise. Um, I push that more than anything. Just about everybody, if they can do it, if they can walk, if they can get on a treadmill, if they can get out and walk every day, um, if they can swim, if they can ride a bike. Just about everybody that has back pain or SI joint pain will get somewhat better um, doing those things, if, if they can do them. That's the thing. Um, and so uh, the injections uh, would be, uh, I sort of do them simultaneously. By the time patients get the injections, they've already been for a few physical therapy sessions and we know if therapy's helping or not. I don't like doing anything. I don't like doing things all at the same time. You know, you don't know which one helped. Um, there's some things I treat with a shotgun approach. Um, there's some things I don't. If I just wanted to go away, um, patients are miserable, and I know what it is, I'll treat it with a shotgun approach. That is therapy, three or four different medicines, whatever. Um, someone's absolutely miserable. Um, but uh, generally, you want to know which thing helped. So um, we inject a steroid in there, and it reduces the inflammation and can provide months to, to even longer uh, uh, years of relief. Uh, radio frequency ablation, this is where you put um, a little electrode in there and high frequency radio wave waves actually can burn nerves and um, it's a minimally invasive way to treat SI joint pain. It just doesn't usually last. It's temporary and nerves, I'm sorry I jumped ahead. I keep hitting the wrong button. Uh, not always successful, temporary and nerves regenerate. Um, in, in, my, in my experience within the spine, there's some guys that love to do radio frequency ablation, and I'll have patients that want to go try it, and they'll do it, and the nerves just regrow. Um, so, um, and it does treat the symptoms, not the not the underlying cause of the symptoms. Um, and the last thing is, is this is a procedure that we've started doing. I, I don't, I'd have to look back and see how long I've been doing it. Um, for a while. I can honestly say that I do not know of one patient that I've done this procedure on that is not doing well, okay? And I've done, many people have done both sides. And I've done this in a couple of my friends. Um, and I wouldn't do something to my friend if I didn't think it would work. Um, one of my farmer buddies that I see all the time, and I would hear about it if he, if he wasn't doing well. Um, so the purpose of, of a SI joint fixation, which formerly, as I talked about, was a big surgery where you went in and put bone graft and plates and screws and cut someone, you know, halfway down their, their hip, um, is now done through a really small three centimeter incision um, in a minimally invasive way where I actually just keep patients overnight and let them go on the next uh, morning. So it's uh, to stabilize the SI joint 
And long-term goal is that these implants, which um, uh, Christy um, is going to pass one around and let people look at, or I don't think we probably have time now. I should have mentioned that earlier. But you can look at one on your way out. This little implant that goes across the SI joint, and we put three or four of them across, and the bone actually grows into the implant um, and stabilizes the SI joint. It's a pretty rigid fixation. Um, even if the bone didn't grow into it, um, it's extremely strong. But with time, it could loosen if the bone didn't grow in. So a lot of the total joint replacements were, are what we call press fit. Um, I do press fit stuff in hip replacements when I have someone fall and break their hip. Um, we pack up, many of you are familiar with this, they get an artificial hip with a stem that goes down in the femur is what we call a press fit. Rarely do we cement them in in place. Bone grows into the implant. And so it's the same thing here. You don't have to worry about it loosening with time when bone grows into it. Um, and so traditional open surgery is a big, big deal. I won't go through the anatomy. You guys aren't here for anatomy lesson, but it's a big incision running from way up here all the way down and pulling all the organs to the side and getting down to that joint. Um, the newer one is, believe it or not, uh, through a small incision, although these look like they're separated a good bit. You know, the, the tissue in the, in the buttocks is fairly mobile. I can make a small incision and just sort of angle um, my guide pin around and do it all under fluoroscopy um, that I can put these three implants across an, a degenerative or painful SI joint. So it's a small incision, doesn't require bone graft, um, less operative time and quicker to uh, activity, quicker return activity. So um, that's mainly what we're wanting to do today is just educate folks that you could have something else going on. Um, and. Um, this is another picture of it, same picture probably. Um, three or four of these pins across the SI joint. It's called the iFuse system. Um, and uh, it's really neat if you want to look at one of the implants. There's one back there you can look at. Um, very high success rate. I mean, I, I don't know how many I've done. I've done a good number of them in the last year, um, over a year. And I, again, I don't know of anybody that's still having problems. And I've done some guys in their 20s up to folks in their 70s. Um, and there is a very, very strong construct. Um, and that's a picture of it right there. You see these little things, and they have this special coating on the outside that, uh, that allows bone to grow into. So the special coating allows bony end growth. Doesn't interfere with lumbar fusion devices. I can actually still see if someone's already had a back fusion. Um, and um, it's uh, four times stronger than a screw. We used to put screws in and hold it and pray that it would fuse. Uh, this is actually stronger than a screw. So this is um, some views of the pelvis. This just sort of shows how that implant goes across uh, the joint. And I'm, I work from the outside of the pelvis in, like from the, um, if you're looking, I, I gotta stay close to this thing. But the incision is sort of, if you can see, my, um, that's, this sounds really funny, if you can see my rear end from here, um, it goes on the side, like right in here. So sort of through the upper part of the buttocks and through a small incision. and. Um, and it's, other than feeling like you got kicked in the butt by a mule, and I don't know what that feels like, because I have, um, you just like a charley horse in your rear end for a couple of days. Other than that, um, it's really not a bad procedure. <clears throat> um, so, for accurate and complete diagnosis, you need to get evaluated. Um, you need to be tested for it. If you think you have it, I mean, you might, just from listening today, you might know if you or somebody else has it. But it's got to be a part of an exam, okay? If you're coming to see me and you think you have it, tell me. Um, because it helps, I'll actually look for it. Yeah, I don't look for it in everybody, okay? But if in people that I'm just not having success, finding the source of their pain, most people that come for back pain do have back pain, okay? About 20, 25% of those will have some SI joint pain too, okay? A lot of times, anything you do to the legs makes the back pain worse. So. Until I get a good picture of what's going on, I don't always test for it. But if you think you have it, I'll go ahead and test for it. I'll forewarn you that you may not like me the next day. Um, because if you have it, I'll make it worse, okay, uh, for at least a day or two. Those, all those stress tests that cause pain, well, that pain doesn't like go away as soon as I stop pushing. It can, it can last for a few days. So um, it's got to be a part of the exam. And uh, successful treatment depends on knowing what you're treating. It really does. It depends on treat, you know, spending time with patients, actually talking to them, listening to them, and actually putting your hands on patients. You know, you actually have to have to do that. Um, 
it's a, it can be a lost thing in medicine these days, not talk bad about other docs. We're under so much pressure um, just to keep the doors open. A lot of us are with decreased reimbursements, you name it, and we have to see more patients in, in less time. And I'm just, I'm one of those that sort of battle that. Um, I'm going to spend the time that patients need if I have to stay here until dark 30. Um, and if I can't, if I can't treat patients like I need, they need to be treated, then I'll find something else to do. I mean, I'm serious. I'm not going to do halfway. I don't do anything halfway. Um, except maybe shave when I'm in a big hurry, you know. When it comes to taking care of people, I'm not going to do it halfway, you know. I'm just not. And if it comes to a day when I can't do that, then you guys will, you know, you won't see my name on the door up there. I left some cards back here. You can take a business card. Um, I think, just looking around the room, most folks in here know where I am or know somebody that knows where I am. I'm upstairs on the fourth floor. It does take a little while to get in a Thank you again for joining us for this edition of Health First. If you'd like more information on this edition or any of our other editions of Health First, feel free to contact us at 737-2600 or on our website at cmchospital.com.